Did everybody in Newark get yourself some lunch? Great. Awesome. Well, thank you everyone for being here for our Inspire Speaker Series. As we wrap up this summer, we are honored uh, for today's speaker, who is an advocate, an equalizer, he's a multiple award-winning journalist, and a best-selling author. Financial Times awarded him the top 10 male feminist, and UN Women dubbed him a global champion of equality. There is a New York Times front page article that names him as a pioneer. So today, Josh Love joins us from Atlanta. He is a father of three, and he's here to tell you about his personal story, along um, with issues that modern families are facing. He's also here to talk about his book, and some of you lucky first ones have received it. It's called All In. So without further ado, Josh, thank you for being here. Yeah. Get this on. How's everybody doing? This is so my life. So right before I came up here, I just got this Facebook message from my wife where my son was having um, some challenges with his math homework. And we've been pushing for him to get tougher math homework. So it was great. You'll see. This is, it fits right in with what I was going to talk to I'm going to talk to you guys about. Thank you for being here. And also thank you for being here in California because I got, I got a message months ago inviting me to, to book this date, and they just said, um, would you come speak at our offices in Newark? And I just, like, automatically from my Gmail, that went into my calendar, and I thought I was going to Newark, New Jersey. I didn't even stop and realize it. And I come back to Silicon Valley all the time, so it's much better to be here. Plus, here I get to dress like this. Um, all right, look, so here's what we're going to do. I'm going to start off with a video clip of something that I did on, on CNN. I'm gonna be, and then you'll see. You'll see how it um, ultimately fits into uh, some more serious things. That, uh, that we're gonna talk about. This is actually a segment I did on HLN, which is our sister channel at CNN. Being a dad, I just love this story, and, and thankfully some dads took action. Basically, what do they want for Father's Day? Uh, for the media to stop portraying dads as buffoons, doofus dads, right? I mean, that's all we ever see. It's not just one or two shows, it's practically every show. And Josh Lev is joining us now. Josh, yeah. you and I are both dads. You've got little ones, i got yeah. teenagers. And enough's enough, and I love it that some dads stood up. It's so true, isn't it? You, you almost, you can't avoid the caricature of us, of dads, as being these complete idiots who can't understand how to do anything. Nothing. Often who don't know how to take care of We're our We're practically another kid in the home in most TV shows. But just so everyone knows, this isn't, this isn't a wine session. I mean, what, what's so interesting <laughs> to me is that dads are doing something about this yeah. now. They're standing up and fighting, and I, I have some proof that they're making a difference. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to start off with an ad that aired earlier this year that was just obviously offensive. Take a look here. To prove Huggies diapers and wipes can handle anything, we put them to the toughest test imaginable. Dads, alone with their babies, in one house, for five days. Okay, so in that ad, Huggies said the, 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 the biggest test imaginable is to, for diapers is to leave kids you alone with dads. Oh, right? of course not. Ew, gross, right? <laughs> I mean, it's just amazing. Okay, they had another one where the dads didn't change the diapers throughout an entire game on double overtime. So what happened here is a bunch of dads got together. They started petitioning online. One guy started a petition. A lot of people complained online. Huggies took it really seriously. They jumped on it. They said, whoa, this was not what we meant. They called one of the dads. They pulled two ads. They replaced them with brand new ads. And here's one of the new ones. Take awesome. A look. To prove Huggies wipes can handle anything, we asked real dads to put them to the test with their own babies on spaghetti night. Really different message there. We asked dads to put them to the test, and you see this happening elsewhere dads as well. Dads cooking as well. Dads He's preparing cooking, a meal. Dads feeding. And so I started to talk to some pop culture analysts and some dads. Whatever, you don't need my pop culture analysis. But um, so here's the thing. So when I first started uh, speaking about this kind of thing at, at sound CNN, like the wine. doing segments like this, um, there were a lot of people who would like get in touch with me and they would say, oh, come on, relax. It's just a joke. It's not that big a deal. TV makes fun of everybody. But what I understood and what I now get to explain through the book and through events is that that's a symptom. These ridiculous representations of dads as incapable and irrelevant, you know, all the Homer Simpsons, it, they matter because they are a symptom of an actual problem, but they're not the most serious symptom. This is a far more serious symptom of the same problem. This shows what's going on with women 
in the workforce is something that gets a lot of talk out here in, in Silicon Valley when we talk about tech companies, which granted overall statistically doing a little better, but still having their struggles. Um, the amount of red shows how many women in any portion of the workforce. So women are entering at almost half the workforce. And as you go up higher in the ranks, women are disappearing. Now, this is also a symptom of a problem I'm going to talk to you guys about, but it's not the most serious symptom. This is the most serious symptom that we're the only country in the developed world. We're almost the only country at all that doesn't make sure that when a baby is born, it can have a parent at home and food on the table for at least a block of weeks. So there are families that are struggling very deeply and very seriously. And this is a struggle that my family had. I'm going to talk to you guys about, but this is the worst symptom of the problem, the, the, uh, the core of the problem, the only way to fix this problem is to get through to what the actual disease is, and it is this, Mad Men. This is where it all comes from. And this is what I'm gonna be able to explain to you today, that the way that we are working now, the way that our modern workforce was designed, factually was created in the 1950s. That's what happened. And it was created on this very strong gendered idea that men work, and women stay home. And if you think about what was going on in America, we were coming out of the war, we we're developing this new country, we, suddenly we were the superpower, we were a new economy. This whole concept of what it is to be successful in America, in this new America, was being created. And that was created based on a very clear gendered system. And it was based on a work-life balance ideal. And the balance is that the man works all the time and the woman's home all the time, and there's your balance. The workplace was not designed for one person to have a life in both places. So a lot of the thinking that we have inherited comes from that. And along with it come the structures, the structures that lead to, to all sorts of challenges. Now, a little bit about me. Uh, I love businesses. I love business. My, my grandfather was a small business owner and an entrepreneur. He, um, he was the one kosher butcher in his tiny little town of Great Barrington, Massachusetts. And he had this little shop at the edge of his driveway that was basically like, like a shack. Like it was, it, it, like it wouldn't even, it, if I went from here to the wall, that's probably twice as big as it was. Yeah, that's about right. I mean, it was tiny. And I remember if he could get an extra penny for an item, I was so excited for him. I understood that when my mom was growing up, those pennies mattered. And that her ability to have enough food on the weekend or a clean dress that weekend would be based on whether he pulled in enough of those pennies. So I've always cared a lot about business and I care a lot about a lot about it because as I grew up, I came to see it in a bigger way that it's about innovation, which is one reason I love coming out here. I'm out in Silicon Valley like every two or three months. So innovation, it, look, all right, let's take a moment to appreciate what you do, okay? Innovation is the story of humanity. It's the reason that we are what we are as a species, that we can, because we create stuff. We create vaccines, we create houses, we create computers, we create the kinds of things that, that you guys create here. And I love that, and I see business as an expression of that. And I've always taken that with me through my work. So I started my career on NPR. Great thing about NPR is you can dress like that all the time and no one cares. Um, and I was based in Atlanta, so I started covering a lot of big businesses like Coke and Delta, but also small businesses. And then I started traveling around the world. I reported from Nuremberg, Germany, interviewed Nazis. I reported from Australia. I've been all over. But everywhere I go, one of the things I watch out for is business. And I talk to business owners and people who work for big businesses. I always want to see, is it a place in which anybody has a shot? No matter what their background is, gender, race, religion, all this stuff, does anybody have a shot? That's a sign of freedom. That's a sign also of democracy. So I'm always looking out for that when I, when I travel. This is how I started my career. And then I jumped over to CNN. Now at CNN, I pitched this role for myself to the president of CNN. And I know that today is also about like learning development. So we can talk about, you know, if you want to talk about career creation, I've always created what I've done. I never applied to NPR or CNN. I, I created what I did in both places. Um, so the, but the role that I pitched for myself at CNN is so ridiculous. It's, it's so preposterous to even have to say, but I pitched myself as this fact checker guy because I would watch CNN and see how all these world leaders, politicians and pundits would get on the air and literally say anything at all. And it's live and no one ever went back and said what was true or not. So it stopped being journalism. So I, I, I said, let me be the guy who just keeps coming in and, and correcting stuff. So this I said, okay, give it a shot. Anyway, it took off. And then I started wearing my glasses on TV. And as soon as I did, they started putting me on TV all the time. <laughs> it's so wild. They were like, oh, the smart guy, the new smart guy with the glasses. And now I can't see with 
without them, but I could before. So I, so I started doing all this, and a lot of what I did was study business stuff, because most of the claims that go on in, in political campaigns are about the economy. So it's, what I learned there ended up being essential in my life. I learned how to understand the difference between a real poll and a fake one. I would go into these efforts totally nonpartisan to try to see, okay, this candidate is saying this will happen with the tax plan. What what do we actually know? So I learned to understand how incredibly few polls and surveys you hear about are real and how many actually make sense. And that ended up applying in the rest of my life. So this is my career. But the bigger part of who I am is that I am a father. And uh, becoming a, hey, raise your hand if you have kids. And be here, you, okay, bunch of you, cool. So um, don't rush it, those of you who haven't started yet. <laughs> but when you become a parent, it's always dramatic. Uh, but what's happened with my family all three times, I got three kids, is just preposterously dramatic. So our, our first son, when he was um, two days old, we found out that he would need major heart surgery, a bypass operation. So here he is at seven days. And um, I like sharing this picture because, you know, as horrifying as it was, as much of a nightmare, it's also exactly what I was just talking about, innovation. It's incredible. It's also beautiful. Look at what we as humanity create. There he is a year later, totally healthy, totally wonderful. Um, so that reminds me, as a reminder, oh, I look at that photo often and I think, okay, don't give in to cynics. Cynics are people who say, oh, we'll never be able to come up with a way to do major surgery on a newborn's heart. But cynics wouldn't have made my kids survive. And people who think outside the box, people who think, you know what, we're going to come up with a solution to this problem that seems intractable, they're the reason he's alive. And they're the reason that we're all alive, ultimately. So I look for solutions, and I look for them obsessively. So anyway, so that was my, my, my first son. Meanwhile, um, with our second kid, we thought, okay, maybe it won't be so much drama this time, but it was. It was my second kid. Uh, the drama there was that he and my wife conspired to skip labor altogether. So three weeks before her due date, she fell to the floor of our bedroom, like basically out of nowhere. There had been no labor. And all of a sudden, stuff started coming out into my hands. Um, I won't get gross, but um, I'm going to share with you all a little clip of my 911 call so that, um, because ultimately you'll see how it all fits in. I, it took me more than a year to be ready to talk about it publicly. The day it happened, people at CNN were like, all right, come on the air, let's talk. But it took me more than a year, but then after that time, when I processed it, I was ready. I did a segment with my friend um, on CNN, his name is Dr. Sanjay Gupta, and uh, here's a little clip so you can hear my 911 call. So she's down on the floor and says, call an ambulance. I get on the phone with 911. Here's a little clip of what happened. What's your idea? I'm okay. holding my baby's head. Okay, listen, I want you to support the shoulders okay. and hold the hips and legs firmly. Okay. And remember, the baby will be slippery, so don't drop it, okay? Okay. Okay, so it's the baby completely out of just the head. No, just the head. I'm seeing okay. the head. It's scrunched up. Let me, let him. But it's not crying. It's not making noise. Its eyes are shut. Okay. Have her to push hard and get the baby out, okay? Push hard. Get the baby out. Push hard. Push hard. Oh, my God. I'm holding my baby. There's right. an umbilical cord and there's someone wrapped around his neck. I'm taking okay. it off. Okay, listen. Gently watch the baby's mouth and nose. Oh, okay. It's choking. It's choking on okay, the cord. Uh, breathe, baby. Breathe. Breathe, baby. Breathe. I'm going to leave the cord off. Let me hear. Let me give you CPR instructions for the baby, okay? Oh, the baby's breathing. Is the baby breathing? Yes, it's breathing. So you can see this bunch of. All right. So um, <laughs> everything worked out great there too. Now, if you haven't had your kids yet, or you plan to someday. Don't be traumatized. None of these things will ever happen to you. Uh, my family is always the exception. This is how it works. We're like the magnet for the exceptions and the things that never happen. Um, now, you might have seen in the screen there, if it was clear, that we skipped about 89 seconds in there. So I know exactly how many seconds before I could see him breathe. I was holding him in my hands, and I didn't even know what gender he was because I was only looking at his neck because the umbilical cord was actually around his neck five times. And this also is a powerful reminder to me of how you never know how one tiny piece of information can make a big difference in your life. The, the 911 operator had been telling me to tie off the umbilical cord with a shoelace. But I just randomly knew not to do that until the baby's breathing. Because my nephew had had a crazy, he's older, he had had a, a crazy birth where the doctors thought he wasn't going to make it. He's perfect. Um, and it turned out he was still getting his oxygen as though he was still in her body. So even though he looked like he wasn't alive, he was still getting out. So I knew not to. And so fortunately, I didn't cut off the umbilical cord. Um, so that little piece of information that opened in my brain, you know, turned out to be helpful. So I also keep in mind as a journalist, like when I'm sharing information with people, you never know what random piece of information might help. But um, 
here's why you need to know about this in the context of the issues I talked about. When my oldest son was born, my response was one that a lot of guys have, a lot of people, but especially men. And that is for the first time in my life, I cared about money. You can tell from my career, I went to Yale and then NPR and CNN, so clearly I had never cared about money before, because you don't take those jobs if you want to make money. But when I had a kid, I was like, whoa, future, mortgage, college someday, all these things started rushing through my head in ways that I had never thought before, and it's really stressful. And at the time, the more I worked, the more I got paid. So I was actually doing like 16-hour days on air at CNN. I would do a lot of literally 16-hour days, so I would be like, you know, double shifting all my on-air time. And, and, and trying to pile up money. And what ended up happening was that I was not present really at home. I had organized this position for myself to be a fact checker so that I wouldn't travel. But I would get home every day and I would start to work really early. I would get home every day and I would you know, take him for walks and make dinner and put him to bed, do his bath, all this stuff, because it was important to me not to miss that time. But I wasn't present mentally. My wife and a lot of the time would be like, you who, where are you? And I would be so tired and so stressed and so, I focused on thinking about my segments for the next day that I was missing a lot. But then when this kid was born, I realized as I processed that, <laughs> that the way I had been living made no sense. For the first time in my life, after this experience, I started looking for work-life balance. Because I realized that in that moment, I didn't care about money. I didn't care about all that stuff. I just cared about the moments of life and real-life connections. Everything else disappeared, but I was trying to make sure he was alive. So I started looking for work-life balance and started seeing that it is just as much of a struggle for dads as it is for moms, but no one ever talks about it. So I started doing these segments on the air about fatherhood. And the responses that we got were ridiculously out of proportion big. This is the first time I did it. I did a series of interviews with a bunch of men. We put three segments on the air. We ended up airing them lots of hours all in one day. And then it went online. It became the number one thing on the CNN newsroom blog. And I started hearing from all these people saying they'd never seen anything like it. Then I started getting calls from media wanting to interview me about being a dad who's in the media who interviews other dads. So I started looking at this and thinking, what's going on? And that's when I came to understand that people had only seen those stereotypes that I mentioned at the beginning and that we talked about in that video at the beginning. They'd never seen real men having actual conversations on TV, the kind of conversation that we actually do have in real life, because we're not stereotypes. We're not just talking about beer and sports. We're actually talking about what kinds of things do you care about? When, when I'm sitting down with these dads, these guys are opening up about their experiences and their challenges and what, what they hope for their kids and what hurts that they don't get to be there for certain moments. And one of the dads is a stay-at-home dad. And we're talking about the economy and the stress and the struggles. And it was too big a response. So that's when I realized that no one was doing this. So I decided, you know what, in addition to all my other reporting, I'm going to start doing this. So I became a CNN columnist. Um, in addition to my standard reporting, I became an op-ed columnist writing about fatherhood. And then we created a show about parenthood on HLN, and I was the in-house in dad talking about all these dad issues. I kept doing more and more about that. Now, when I started taking that fact check lens and putting it onto fatherhood, the same thing happened again. Some people were just out of proportion stunned by kinds of things that I would report. So these are examples, these are facts. And I knew how to tell which surveys are real, which surveys are fake. So these are actual studies. And in the book, you'll see, it's the most footnoted book you'll ever see. Working dads in the US spend an average of three hours each workday with their children. Virtually all who live with their kids care for them in every category at least several days a week. And dads are suffering from as much work-life conflict, if not more, than women. By the way, that top point there, that dads spend an average of three hours each workday with their kids. Um, no, the middle point about the dads who live with their kids. Black dads are actually the most involved dads in America. They actually edge out all other fathers. And most black dads actually do live with their kids. There are so many stereotypes out there that are completely false. And the extent to which dads in America are doing awesome has not been discussed. And what I came to understand is that that is a crucial women's rights issue. This is how all that came about. So we had um, our two kids and we uh, were like, all right, time for baby number three. This time it's gonna be the drama-free baby. Nothing's gonna go wrong. Instead, my uh, baby girl and I ended up on the front page of the New York Times business section. So here's what happened there. Um, my wife and I looked at what was going on in our family and we realized that for a combination of reasons, I would be needed at home after our daughter was born. And that's not a strange idea. It's not that unusual. Dads do caregiving now, it happens. Unfortunately, 
we have inherited a structure from the Mad Men era in which policies make no sense. So the policy at CNN was such that any parent could get 10 paid weeks to care for their new child, except a guy who got his own wife pregnant. So if I put my daughter, yeah, I know, I'll give you a second. I'll give you a second. If I put my daughter up for adoption and another guy I worked with adopted her, he could get 10 paid weeks. If I had a same-sex domestic partner, all right, follow this. So I have a same-sex domestic partner. He adopts a baby, but I do not co-adopt the baby. So I'm not legally a parent. I can still get 10 paid weeks to care for his baby. Women who had babies from surrogacy, uh, so they weren't pregnant. Everyone could get 10 paid weeks except a dad in the traditional scenario. Anyone who's a parent. So I went to the company in secret in advance, and I was like, this has got to be an oversight. There's no way that when you were adding all these groups of people, you meant to exclude traditional dads. And they were like, oh, that's so interesting. You know, put it in writing. So I did. I asked for the benefit. Months went by. There was no answer. I kept checking in. I was informed that it had become a, a Time Warner-wide thing. It wasn't just CNN. So when we talk Time Warner, we're talking to everybody. I mean, DC Comics, Warner Brothers, HBO. It was like this big thing, apparently, that they were, that they were all communicating on. Um, and then because it's my family, drama. My wife goes in for her 35-week appointment, has major and very scary symptoms from preeclampsia. Even in today's day and age, if preeclampsia becomes eclampsia, it's still deadly. So it's really scary. So they, they started doing surgery. They, they needed to um, induce her right then. And so I'm messaging work from the hospital room, still no answer. So 11 days later, I'm home holding my four-pound preemie, who fortunately was totally healthy. She was literally the size of a doll. I put her in a small pasta colander once and caring for my sick wife. I mean, she was sick from preeclampsia, and then the medicines that you have to take for your blood pressure make you totally woozy, and caring for my two boys, and that's when work said no. I had messaged them saying, okay, a dad like me can only get two weeks. Am I getting the 10 weeks or no? What's happening? And that's when they wrote back saying no. Now, the rest of what happened is in the book, but I want you to know two things for right now going into this, and the first is that I decided to take legal action, and when I did this, the responses that came in instantly were crazy huge again. I announced that I was uh, filing a charge uh, with the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission against this decision. And that night, when I put it on social media, I instantly started hearing from all these groups, and it was across the board. It was conservative and liberal business leaders. It was a lot of dads groups, but it was tons of women's groups. Sheryl Sandberg's groups got in touch, uh, Maria Shriver. All these groups started getting in touch. And so I, as a journalist, became fascinated. What is it about my family's little situation that people care about so much? That's when the New York Times business section thing happened. I get a call. They're talking about you on the Today Show right now. It became this very surreal moment and a switcheroo for me as a journalist to be talked about. But when I started analyzing this, why do people care about this? And why were so many women's groups getting so uh, um, active on my case? That's when I came to understand that we are all in this together. That all of us who care about actual equality, both at work and at home, are stuck with these backward policies that make absolutely no sense. So when I started digging into it for the book and putting two and two together, this is what I came to understand. What we have in this country is a combination of laws, workplace policies, and stigmas that act as gender police, that to this day push women to stay home and push men to stay at work. And so the, all of the pressures, all of the things that make it so much harder for women to rise up in the workplace are making it so much harder for men to stay home. And the opposite is true. All of these things, the laws, the policies, the stigmas that take away the opportunity for a guy like me to stay home is also taking away the opportunity for a woman to stay at work, to advance her career. And so this is why it's all one thing. And this is what you'll see in the book. My publisher, by the way, is in San Francisco, Harper One, which is part of Harper Collins. I love them. So now so many things make sense to me. For example, you guys have probably heard a lot that people complain about the fact that the United States is the only developed nation with no maternity leave. People talk about that all the time, but no one had ever explained why. Why are we the only, almost the only nation? It's, it's literally, it's just us and, and Suriname and Papua New Guinea and some tiny islands that no one has ever heard of that doesn't have a societal structure to make sure a mom can stay home for a bunch of weeks and have enough to still put food on the table. But now I understand why we don't have paid maternity leave. Of course we don't. She's a woman who needs her money. A man's supposed to make all the money. That's where this comes from. It is this basic sexist idea. It's a prism through which all of our work structures were created. So what you're seeing here 
is a map that shows the countries around the world that, um, <laughs> that have maternity leave. And the countries that technically in dark red are the ones that have zero paid maternity leave. So it's, it's us. I mean, I did the math. If you look at the number of people who live in countries without paid maternity leave, 98% of them are Americans who live in the United States. Now, this is a look at paternity leave. Paternity leave is interesting because there is a lot of paternity leave available around the world. The darker the nation, the more paternity leave available from society. And I'll explain how, it, how it, it's structured. Um, the United States has zero. But what's really saddest about this map is that it's almost irrelevant because all over the world, most paternity leave goes unused. And the reason is that it's available as a choice. The mom can take it or the dad can take it. And these, these, these stigmas are global and they're proven. These same stigmas that a man is supposed to stay at work and a woman is supposed to stay at home exist in lots of different cultures and lots of different ways. And there are a couple cultures in which if a man stays home, he can be seen as bewitched by his wife. That's just staying home. If he's seen in public caring for his child. So these same stigmas can apply everywhere. But there is more paternity leave. By the way, you guys might be interested in this, or you might not be, I don't know. But you see, if like you look in Europe, like, you know, go, go up to, to France and, and Spain, and you guys see a little dot of white, that's Switzerland. Switzerland doesn't have, <laughs> Switzerland does not have, all right, I'm glad you're laughing and not kicking me out. Switzerland does not have paternity leave, and they recently had a battle over it in which a bunch of people were trying to make it happen, and it has not happened yet. But it's the way that things are moving in the world, fortunately, and it will. So those, that's about the laws, but the most powerful thing that we have, as I mentioned, are the stigmas. So for the book, I started interviewing all these dads, because after my case, all these people came out of the woodwork with their stories. It's crazy what's happening. It is so sexist. So, so here's some examples from the book. One man was told that he could not have the time he's legally entitled to because women are supposed to stay home and take care of the baby unless they're in a coma or dead. Another guy, this is a guy, um, had a legal case. He, he, he works at a law firm. You would think law firms would be some of the most forward thinking on this, but they're actually not. So many law firms are like the worst on this. So he was a rock star at his law firm. And then while his wife was pregnant, she had mental illness and she attempted suicide. He ended up take, staying home to care for her and the baby for just a handful of weeks. When he came back, um, not only was he no longer a rock star, they wouldn't give him his old cases. They demoted him. A few months later, they fired him. And in a deposition, admitted that they have traditional views, macho views, basically, of what men and women are supposed to be doing. Every time you hear a story like this, you have to understand how essential it is for women's rights. This when I couldn't stay home, my wife couldn't take an opportunity she had. All of these things are flip sides of the exact same coin. And it's horrible. There's another guy, I'll tell you quickly, I'll, and I'm definitely going to get you out on time, so uh, if I start going on tangents, don't worry, but I want you to hear the story. So um, he's a guy in Atlanta. I interviewed him. And he, when he, when he uh, was at work, he got a call. His wife was 38 weeks pregnant, and something went wrong. Again, it won't happen to you. But the, um, the placenta stopped working, baby wasn't moving, they needed to uh, deliver immediately. And um, so he, he was crying, he ran out of work. Fortunately, everything worked out great. He only missed the rest of that week. It was a couple days of work. He came back to work on Monday and his boss called him in and rebuked him. How dare you take off so much time? Don't you know you're needed around here? And that boss was a pregnant woman. So unfortunately, this kind of stigma isn't always being carried out by men. Among the very few women who managed to make get up the ranks in these higher positions, often it's because they have had to come to, or just happen to on their own, have these same sexist ideas. So the women who are leading the fight, uh, the female lawyers who are leading this fight against these old ways of thinking in the workplace, um, they weren't even surprised when I told them that that was a woman. Because they said, yeah, it happens sometimes. Unfortunately, there's this vicious cycle in which leaders of businesses look for people who have that same traditional way of thinking, um, and they lift them up the ranks. But there are exceptions to that. And there are big exceptions to that, even regionally, like here. This is what's going on in America. Um, more than half of companies have some kind of maternity leave. They call it maternity leave, but it actually isn't maternity leave. And a big part of the problem, and the issue that I talk about in the book, is that no one, almost no one in America really knows what's going on with this stuff, because these, these laws and these policies are so complicated. I don't think CNN even understood that everyone could get 10 paid weeks except for traditional dad until I came along and explained it. No one realizes what this stuff is says. So more than half of companies have paid maternity leave, but they actually don't. In most cases, what they're doing is paying a woman for the disability when she takes time off after having a birth. 
they're using their disability insurance policies. So it's literally the exact same thing as if I break my leg and I get that time off. So it's referred to as maternity leave. It sounds like maternity leave, but it's actually usually paid for by disability. 14% of companies have some paternity leave. And what's really unfortunate is that the amount offered has been going down. Now, there has been a lot of good news. I'm sure you guys have seen this out in this area. A lot of companies out here have been changing the story for, this whole, for America, which is great because they're proving that when you have better policies, as I'm about to show you, it's better for the bottom line. So some of them that have announced new policies, Microsoft, Facebook, you know, Google, these are big companies that have the ability to, Amazon finally got paternity leave, they've established it. So we're seeing a lot of big companies move in the right direction. But the most important lesson from them is that they can show businesses that it's good business. And I'll talk you through some of these numbers. The, the real thing that we need in America is paid family leave. It's what you have here in California already. And this is a statewide system in which businesses are not required to pay people during leave. I don't want laws in which businesses are required to pay people during leave because that's not a necessary solution. What California has shown in New Jersey and Rhode Island and New York is about to have it and the state of Washington passed it, they will get it. What the way it works, as you all probably know, is that there's this very small payroll deduction. Your money goes into that fund. And then when you need paid family leave, it's not just about caring for a baby, it's for everyone. That's why I use this picture here. Caring for an elderly loved one, caring for a spouse, caring for yourself after an illness, it's proven everyone can use paid family leave. You get some paid time off from that. Now, this is how well it's working. I've studied so many business policies, as I mentioned earlier, this is the most successful policy at all that I have seen, not just family oriented. So businesses in California were asked how it's affecting them. The number that said it's either had a positive or no noticeable effect on, look at this, profits 91%, productivity 89%, turnover 96, morale 99. And by far the majority of those all said it was going up. The majority said it was positive, not just neutral. New Jersey has a similar policy. Look at this, 18 diverse businesses surveyed, 12 said it had a positive effect, six said neutral, none said it was hurting them. And of course it wasn't hurting them. Once I dug into this for the book and I followed the money, this literally a chapter called Follow the Money, I saw how all this is playing out. That's the New York one. This is, this is why it matters financially. All right, businesses right now are losing workers all the time. A lot of people are dropping out of the workforce because they don't have paid family leave. That shrinks the overall tax base, it shrinks our corporate productivity, it shrinks our entire economy. And for each business, it's really expensive to replace an employee. According to SHRM, it can be up to 200% of annual salary to replace an employee. And if you think about it, that actually makes a lot of sense. Because when you're replacing an employee, you have to go searching for someone and you have to do all these interviews and you fly them in and you finally, and all these people are part of this decision. And these people, while they're doing that, are not doing their other job. And someone else is trying to do that person's job or the, or the person that you lost or it's just not getting done. And then at the end of that, you fly the person's family there, you move them, you give them housing for a while, you train them, you get them all set up. Even at the end of all that, even when you get the replacement in place, that person still isn't as good as the person you lost because they're new. So it's this very expensive proposition. And this is what's happening to a lot of companies. And unfortunately, they don't realize that a lot of men, as well as women, are leaving for this kind of thing. This is an example of a small business in my book. They have only 18 employees and they give three paid months paid parental leave. Now, I don't think most businesses could or should, but I asked their CEO, why did you choose to do this on your own? Because this is not, she's in Massachusetts, so they don't have a state fund making this possible. I said, why did you choose to do this? And she said, oh, it's easy. It's good for our bottom line. She went over it with me. It is. Because they are attracting and retaining the highest quality employees now. They're not losing them. And she found that paying them for three months is a lot better than paying 200% of annual salary to try to replace them. This is what we all have to understand, that this is going on for both men and women. Right now, with the lack of paid family leave, a lot of people are taking big career breaks. Paid family leave, when it exists, gets people working. What happens instead is the mom will take her disability time, and then she'll take her paid family leave time, and she'll come back to work, and the dad will take his paid family leave time. And between the two of them, it ends up being this block of several months in which they get to figure out what their structure is going to be going forward. And then you get to talking about things like flexibility. And by the way, yes, it would be great if families could afford all over this country to have one parent at home full time. Sure, that's a nice ideal. It's also usually just impossible right now because if you look at macroeconomically what's going on in America, you got stagnant wages, you got people with preposterous sums of debt 
by the time they're done college and grad school, they can't afford to have someone stay home. So when you have like childbearing age, that's like the perfect example of people who are saddled by debt. So they don't have the option of someone staying at home. So often what they do instead, like a lot of families fall into poverty. The number of people who are taking advantage of state services is going up. All these situations that arise, but when you have paid family leave, instead you keep people in the workforce and making money. Right now about half of women and more than one in five men are taking real career breaks after having babies. Most women who stopped their careers say that a central reason is that their husbands didn't have a choice. There was no paternity leave. There was no option for the men to stay home. And check this out. EY found this, and it fits right in with the studies in my book. Men are even more likely in this country than women to change jobs or careers, to give up promotions, take pay cuts, move to be near family, or even move to other states or other countries with better paid family leave. The trick for guys is that we do leave our jobs all the time for jobs that have, actually a lot of guys in my book took pay cuts, but went and went to work for smaller firms that gave them flexibility, that gave them family time. Because these days guys care a lot more about time with family than they do about money. All the studies show it. But unfortunately, guys aren't telling our bosses that that's what we're doing because we don't talk about this in the workplace because there's been all these stigmas. So but these, these businesses did not know this is why they're losing a lot of men. They think, oh, the guy got a better job. He left. Okay, it's too bad. You know, we really liked him. We wanted to keep him. But what they didn't know is that this is why. This is why it was recently a great opportunity when um, there was a Chicago White Sox player, Adam LaRoche. Did you guys hear about this? He turned down $13 million because they didn't want him bringing his kid into the clubhouse anymore. Now, that's fine. I mean, they can have any rule they want. But I would have told them in advance that if they said he couldn't bring his kid anymore, he probably would leave. They were stunned. They didn't see it coming. But anyone who follows actual statistics would see that dads these days care more about time with their families than they do about money. Adam LaRoche giving up $13 million is an exact equivalent to guys in my book giving up $20,000. He has all this money. And he's like, no, I'd rather have that time with my family. This happens all the time. So we need this wake-up call. The more people talk about this, the more the stigmas go away and the more businesses succeed. And I tell small businesses, look, I, I know you could not, most small businesses could not afford, they don't have enough money to say, okay, we'll pay you for a month or two while you're not doing the work. That's why we need a public structure, nationally a paid family leave. But I also tell small businesses all the time that the number one thing to do is to communicate about this. So many people told me that they would have stayed at their small business if the bosses had just said, hey, we know things are you know, going to be changing for you. What can we do to work this out? We don't have money to pay you a block of time while you're off. Maybe we can work out some flexibility or maybe we can you know, give you a different schedule so you're doing four days or maybe we can help you find childcare. Just having a conversation about it, not being afraid anymore to communicate about these issues is essential. And the other half of this is ending those lies that I talked about at the beginning, these myths about dads that are so damaging that lead to these negative policies. If you believe that a dad is actually lazy, then don't give him paternity leave. What's paternity leave? What that means is he's going to be at home doing nothing, hanging out, waiting for his wife to come home and do everything anyway, and you're paying him? Keep him at home. Keep him in the office. This is why there's something called, that's proven, that's called the hours stigma, in which men are still raised up the ranks in America, literally for sitting at our desks for more hours and not for getting more work done. Because there's this expectation. If you're out of the office, that must mean you're lazing. It must mean you're not doing anything. And when businesses see through that, and they instead start looking at what a guy got done every month or quarter, whatever analysis point they want to use, they realize that it's not the guy who's sitting at his desk the most, which is why they start to accept flexibility. So we have to break these myths, because as long as we have these, women won't have the choice of staying at work either. This is a perfect example of how my industry blows it all the time and feeds this myth. It's so offensive, and it's so obviously wrong, and I have contacted Pew, and they won't do anything about it. Okay, so Pew, Pew, they're like my nemesis now, Pew Research. So they did this study, another gender gap. Men spend more time in leisure activities. And then as a result of the Pew study, I can tell you in news, everyone takes Pew at face value as though it's gospel. So these are headlines that came out of that. The gender leisure gap, why women are losing their time to just chill out. Report, men have more time for fun than women do. And the worst I found is in the bottom right, that's just from time. The moral of the story, whether it's weekday or weekend, Dads need to spend less time on the golf course or watching TV and more time helping their wives take out the trash and play with the kids. This is straight up stereotype. Now, let me tell you what the study actually said. Remember how I learned how to dig into actual, okay. So there's this thing called the American Time Use Survey in which Americans were asked to divvy up, break down for surveyors what your average day is like. In that study, 
dads on average, men on average, listed 20 more minutes per day as being for leisure or sports. But what Pew did not mention is that moms listed the exact same time more per day, about 20 minutes each day more as being for sleep. Now, I would never do a story that says moms get more sleep. It's obnoxious. It's misleading because the dads are getting more leisure time. It's this tiny amount of time. And when you deal with margins of error and confidence intervals, that amount is actually negligible anyway. It's not even a real amount. What we actually know is that men and women are working equally hard on behalf of our families. And this is, oh, this is how I feel every time I see these headlines. So what we actually know, and this is a line from my book, today's dads and moms are equal, work equally hard on behalf of our families. When you combine paid work with household chores and childcare, it's about the same amount of time. And it's a lot of time. Dads and moms are putting in a lot of time. And this is important to understand when you're, sure, sometimes you'll hear another statistic out of, out of context. You'll hear people say, do you know that when men and women both work full time, the mom still does three times as much childcare and twice as much, and twice as much uh, housework. And this is just more of the same misleading statistics. Yes, overall, that's the case because women are putting in fewer hours in the workplace and men are putting in more hours in the workplace. And this gets back to all the problems I'm talking about. The fact that men don't get flexibility, the fact that these options are not there and the wage gap, which factors in. Families need money, especially with stagnant wages. Since we have this ridiculous wage gap, which is real, men are still being paid more. So families need the man to keep working more to pull in that money. It's important to understand that we've achieved a level of egalitarianism in the American home that no one even knows about. So ending anti-dead myths is, is crucial for the global economy. Right now, as long as we have these myths, we're going to have backward policies all over the world. And this is the good news, that there are companies out there that are changing the game a little bit by really positive advertising. Here's a clip. Daddy. Daddy. Dove Men Plus Care. Care. Care makes a man stronger. See how, yeah, they, did that? Makes you See how they did that? With hashtag Full disclosure, I now do, not today, but I now do some work with this company because they are, are leading the way with the positive uh, representations of dads. Um, but uh, that, what's great about that is that it was in the Super Bowl. So people are coming to understand how important this is. All right, good. I'm going to have exact amount of time to talk to you guys afterwards. So um, this is how I like to end this, by asking a question. What was your first dream? And when I ask this, and a lot of people, I, first of all, I don't mean overnight dream. Uh, no other, I mean like your aspirational dream, what you wanted to be. When we think about that, what comes to mind first is usually people say things like, I wanted to be a ballerina, I wanted to be an astronaut, I wanted to be a cowboy. Um, but we're wrong. The first dream that we all had was the same one. It was to be held and loved and to, to explore this amazing world, whatever it is, with love in our lives. You see that in the eyes of any baby. I saw it because I was there the moment each of my baby came out and I saw the eyes. That's the first dream. It, but it's, it's so deep inside us that we don't even think about it, that we just take it for granted. It's literally primal because it's the first thing we experienced. That's the first dream. So what I'm pushing for, you know, I left CNN, I'm, I'm doing this full time now. I travel around, I work with a lot, lot of companies to build better policies. I work with the UN, I'm traveling around the world, I'm, I'm helping do what I can to try to establish a better relationship between work and life. And the reason is that to me, ultimately, it's the story of humanity. You know, I mentioned earlier that innovation is the story of humanity, but I kind of lied. It's about half the story of humanity, maybe slightly less than half. The other half is this, love, connection. We love, we connect, we feel. It's the biggest experience in life. So, Putting these two pieces together, innovating to create stuff, 
to create technology and to create better policies. And living in a way, doing that in a way that we all get to experience this ultimate first dream. That is what it is to be all in. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for having me today. Thank you. That's my thank you screen. Um, by the way, uh, so let's talk now. We got, I, I left the time I wanted to, so I'm going to take your questions. We'll talk about some stuff, and then afterwards I'll stick around and sign books for you or for anybody who wants. Um, everybody link in with me. I, they say only link in with people you know. I don't know why they say that. Everybody link in with me. Get on LinkedIn. I'm all about LinkedIn right now. So send me a LinkedIn. Um, okay, so uh, questions, comments, concerns, things that horrify you, things that disturb you. If not, I'm just going to keep talking at you. Uh, sure, go ahead. Oh, wait, did you want him on a microphone so the other cities can hear? Ellie. Sorry about that. What's your name? John. Hey, John. John. Hello. <laughs> um, so I, I think it was a cool um, fact that you brought up because um, I'm 28 and exactly what you said, I'm noticing it amongst friends who are having children um, that our generation is just so inundated with student loan debt, with you know rising housing prices. Um, I know you, you're not going to know an answer, but what do you think is going to be the solution for maternity, paternity leave in this country, and you know, is it going to change? Why would I not know the answer? I know the answer. <laughs> oh no, 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 no! Oh, I got yeah. you. What's well, no. the timeline? Because it makes oh. me it makes me worry. Oh. It makes me worry. Yeah, the time. You're asking when it will finally happen. Or, right, when you oh. think it'll finally okay. happen. All right. So yeah. here's here's the. Let's start with the good news. Um, what I love about talking about this issue is that it's like fixing potholes, because. The solution is right there in front of us. This is not a case of all, all these different perspectives, let's fight about it. There's really no fight left. The groups that used to fight against this stuff aren't anymore. I, I explained the book. It used to be the Chamber of Commerce and the Society for Human Resource Management who said, no, it'll kill jobs, no paid family leave. And now that the numbers are in and it's great for business, they've gone completely silent. So this is the key to getting it through. So we're, we're getting more and more. What we need is a na national system based on the state one here. We're getting more and more on the state level. We need a national one. And we are working in the right direction. More and more Democrats on Capitol Hill are starting to support it. Nationally, the overwhelming majority of Republicans, independents, and Democrats in repeated polls said they want paid family leave for nationally. Unfortunately, and I've been on Capitol Hill pushing this, unfortunately, there's a disconnect between what the majority of Republicans want and what Republicans are focusing on on Capitol Hill when it comes to this. And that has to do with all sorts of things, gerrymandered districts and the people you really have to pay the most attention to rather than the majority. What we need are some brave Republicans to step forward and say, yes, the state model that's been proven to work in these states is what we need. I do believe we'll get there because there was a long, hard battle to get Family Medical Leave Act, which is for unpaid leave in America. It's very inadequate, but it's something. It passed in 1993. And a lot of people fought against it back then. And you'll see prominent people in the book, including prominent conservatives, who say now that they've seen what happened with FMLA, they actually do support it. So I do believe we will get there. Um, I would love to think that we could get there in the next five years. That would be amazing. But um, you know, I would sooner hedge my bets than say 10. But I think we'll get there. Yeah, things are going in the right direction. Switzerland will probably get there before we do. <laughs> Hi, yes, sir. Oh, uh, do you want him to have the microphone, Ellie, wherever? OK. okay. Do you have a slide? Sure. Sure. <laughs> well, there's no rank anywhere. That, so the ranking system doesn't exist. So I can only tell you what, what works and, and what doesn't work. As for what your policies are, I always leave that to your HR people to explain what your policies are. I make a habit of not knowing too much about like the host company and what they've gone through, unless they want me to. And some of the companies I've talked to instead do the opposite. Like they bring me in and I do workshops with managers and I do a talk for employees and then I come back and help implement new policies. And that's part of what's exciting about what I do now is like sometimes when there's an announcement that a big company has announced a new policy, I know it's coming because they've been working with me for months and then I get to announce it as soon as it comes out. So based on what I'm told, you guys have created paternity leave in the last couple of years, right? Is that right? But um, you know, I encourage it, but I have no idea where you guys would fit or not fit. I don't, I don't know. Sorry. <laughs> uh, anybody else? Uh, yeah, sure. Go ahead, please. Mike. Oh, it's over here. It's working its way around. So uh, I was really intrigued by your comment about how you tell when polls are real and not real. Mm -hmm. Do you, Can you talk just more about that a little bit? Sure. So, uh, so many 
things that are reported as being surveys um, were just like ridiculous. Like they were online surveys where anybody can choose to go to a website. That, that means nothing. That has absolutely no value. You have to learn about like statistical sampling and weighting based on certain characteristics and um, actual random phone dialing and make sure that it really is random phone dialing when it's being done. And the good thing is that polls that have a track record, you can actually see them playing out. For example, when Obama ran for president in 2008, there were theories that there might be something called a Bradley effect, which was this idea that people would tell pollsters that they'll vote for a black man, but they really won't. We were able to conclusively state that there was no Bradley effect because we knew which polls are legit. And the polls that were legit exactly matched the ultimate vote. This is also why when you tune out a lot of the noise and the craziness of what people are saying and you look at actual polls, you can see that many polls are within a percentage point of the way that votes actually ultimately take place. It's the same with the predictions for annual retail sales, like once you got Black Friday coming along. There are certain firms that do an excellent job each year of within their margin of error, maybe three percentage points, predicting what kind of sales will be and specifically within each unit. And that means that they have a really good sense of the shopping um, patterns that have been going on. But the actual figures, I'm, I'd have to sit down with you and show you, but learning, learning the random sampling, learning um, how to weight it, learning whether they're still using phone dialing, weeding out any kind of like optional internet surveys, all of these things, all of these are essential. And then you can look at the overall track records over time. So Nate Silver has a thing online where he looks at like 100 different polling sites and which ones have been the most successful in being right over time. And so that's pure numbers. That's what I love about this stuff is I am really totally nonpartisan. You know, I would never, I, I don't align with any party. I want to see where the solutions are. And these polls that are legit really do show, um, you know, where Americans stand on this stuff and people around the world. Yeah, sure. Anybody else? Yeah, go ahead. I can repeat your question if the mic doesn't get there in time. It's fine. What do you think uh, is uh, the right amount of lead? Right? What's the right amount of lead? Um, uh, I mean, I, I, having worked in, uh, with people in Finland, for example, mm -hmm. there was this uh, this woman that got a full year paid, right? A second year half pay, right? And a third year uh, where we were supposed to just hold the position. I know. I know. And Right. No, no, no. I know. I know. Yeah. No. So, so, um, so part of the problem is that there are parts of Europe in which it's become so incredibly much time that bosses are less likely to hire a woman because they know that she's probably going to be gone for an extremely long time. The good news is that the solution to that is gender equality so that you can't know from. So you're asking about a figure, right? How, how? The thing is that, I mean, it's interesting because I'm not even sure that that's too much for a business because the right. cost for society, right? Because what you also have is the Finns ranking number one year after year in terms of uh, their um, elementary school education, mm -hmm. right? And that's their, their, their thinking now that it may be because they're spending so much time at home mm -hmm. with their parents oh, yeah. the first years of their lives. Yeah, I mean, and, you know, there's a, a, a social structure that can be used in which you as a society make sure that a parent can be home. And then each society, see, the, it is working in many ways, and I'm going to explain to you what this is. Um, but there's also severe limits to how far that would ever go in America, because we have a different relationship to taxation, which is also okay to have that. Um, but we, uh, what we need to understand is that making paid family leave available, making sure it, it has to be framed as a baby has the right to a parent at home. When you get into conversations like, does a woman have a right to this? Does a man have a right to this? You can fight. You can't fight over whether a baby has a right to having a parent at home. And you brought up Northern Europe, so I'll mention this. I mentioned that the stigmas are global. What these three countries did was create father quotas in which there's this block of time that's not available to mom or dad, only available to dad. And these revolutionized society. <laughs> what happened here was all these guys before would let, you know, the, the women would take it because of the stigma. These are such substantial blocks of paid time that a guy looks like an idiot for turning it down. Who's going to turn down 10 weeks or five months? So instead, these guys are taking the time. It went from single digits to in the 90s percentages of men taking this time. And then that has cultural effects. When I was speaking at Oxford, there was a whole bunch of young people in the room. And I said, who here has babysat? And everyone raised their hand. And then I said, uh, and the young people like in their 20s, young compared to me. And, and then um, I said, OK, who here has ever babysat for an infant? Because this is part of the problem. Why boys don't babysit for infants in this society? And when I asked that question, only girls raised their hand except one guy. And I said, oh, really? You babysat for an infant? And he said, yeah, well, I'm from Norway. 
this is what happens when you grow up seeing men care for infants as well. You realize that, of course, you can. And I think that just means this one out, right? Uh, no, whatever. It's not my computer. I don't care. By the way, hi to the people in other cities who are, who are watching this. Thank you. And you can all link in with me, too, and ask me questions that way. All right. Well, listen, I don't want anyone to feel trapped here, so feel free to start leaving. But I, um, and I did promise I'd let you go at one, but I'm going to be right here answering questions and signing books and doing whatever you want to do. Thank you all for having me today. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. All right. Yes, I have. Yes. Um, awesome. Now, whom should I make it out to? How do you spell it? Y-E-S. Y-E-S.